and we're starting uh, with our keynote address from um, Dr. John Mee, who's a principal veterinary research uh, officer with Chagask, uh, who are our Irish agricultural research organisation. So I'll hand you over to John Mee. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, John. Um, first, it's a pleasure to be here to speak to an audience, and such a big audience. Usually, young stock gets the small theatre, very few people attend, so I'm delighted to see such a crowd here today. It reflects greatly on the speakers, of course it does. Okay, so um, my lecture today is going to be what I describe as a pracademic lecture. So it's given by what you could describe as an academic, but I'm quite a practical academic, and I want practical implications for you to take home. So after you leave this room, you should be able to do something or know something that you couldn't do or didn't know before you came in. And if you don't, I've failed. That's my objective. So it's practitioner focused. So for the academics in the room, the research scientists snooze. <laughs> but I want to know how many, how many we've got in this room who are practitioners. So you heard about the app. We're all high tech now. So please start voting on the app for what you are. It's got these simple questions. The idea is that it'll come up on the screen when you do, so everybody will be able to see the response, rather than hands up, which people can't see. So you're looking at me. You should be looking at your phones. Are people using it or not? No. What's the problem? No connection. Is that the same with everybody? Tech, you fail me again. They overpromise and underdeliver every time, just like vets. <laughs> OK, so tech fails. Let's go back to old school. If you are a practitioner, use your, use your hands. Just one hand. Right, so I'm guesstimating we're about 50% of the hall, roughly. I'm not a statistician. Statistician would tell the probability is right. OK. <coughs> so we got about 50% vets, real vets. OK, so it's target. <laughs> oh. Apologies. Apologies. I did not mean to say that out loud. <laughs> right. So we've got practitioners and others. Right. Oh, so it is working. OK, so some people are using it. So my 50%, I'm out by 8%. That's OK. I'm happy with that. OK, so that's exactly what I wanted. So I wanted. No disrespect to the other people here, but I did focus my talk. You saw the title of my talk, so you know what you're going to get when you come in. Right. Okay, let's move. Oh, next slide. <coughs> right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, then I'm going to tell you it, <coughs> and then I'm going to tell you what I told you. You're keeping up with that? Okay. That's how it's going to work. So I'm going to go back a little bit, a bit of background. So basics on case definitions. I know this is boring stuff, but I'm going to introduce a, a little bit of practicality to it. I'm going to ask a simple question. Why would you bother? Why bother investigating these cases? Let's take a negative attitude to it. I'm, I'm known as quite a cynic, so I take that attitude. I'm going to discuss investigative thresholds. So when would you bother investigating if you decide you will? And then I'm going to go to the basics of the cause and the time of death. And then I'm going to go to what should a practitioner do? This is my advice, my recommendation, but feel free to argue with me. That's why I'm up here. At the herd level, I'm going to go through the risk factors, lab results, and the pregnant cohort. And for the individual case, I'm going through the dam, the fetus, and the placenta. Then the thorny one down at the bottom. I know you can't read it at the back. I'm conscious of that. What it says is diagnosis not reached, DNRs. And I'm going to ask the question, why not? And what can we do about it? So I'm really conscious the people at the back of the hall cannot read the bottom of the screen at all. So if I'm not pointing it out to you, put your hand up, and I know immediately I'm missing it for you. Apologies as the way the room is. So that's what you're going to spend the next 40 minutes of your life listening to. You had other options, but you came in, so tough. <laughs> OK, so the first thing about case definitions in anything, in repro or mastitis, they're all arbitrary. So what I put up here, feel free to use your own one, but these are the ones I use. So this is the science. This is for the, what is it, 42% of people in the room? Expulsion of fetus between implantation 42 and a limit of viability, let's say 260 days. We're all happy with that. That's what an abortion is. We all learned it in college. There's going to be a few buts in this slide. But a 42-day fetus is 2.5 cm long. That's the crown rump length. It's generally resorbed. The cow returns to estrus. 
It's not visible. It's not submitted to a lab. So including that in your definition of abortion for practical purposes is irrelevant. In practice, it's the expulsion of a visible, greater than 120-day, non-viable fetus, less than your limited liability, that could be observed slash submitted to the lab. Why have I picked 120 days? I examined 110, no, 10,000 fetus that were submitted to our local lab, and I broke it out by what age they were when they were submitted. And 96% of fetuses were greater than 120 days. That's what happens in practice in Ireland. It may or may not happen in your lab. So, at 120 days, and I'm going to visually show you this, the fetus is about 25 centimetres. And across, there's intrauterine growth to retardation, so it varies, but approximately. It's about a kilo, about the size of a small cat. You do also get late returns to heat, late preg negatives and no calves. So there are a whole lot of other things that you don't see with a fetus, but in general, that's a fetus. There's a but again. There's a diagnostic gap between 42 and 120 days. That's 25% of gestation I've just thrown out and forgotten about. I would say in Ireland, we don't know what prevalence of loss is there. I happened to discuss it with an American colleague yesterday, and he estimated in their systems about 15%. So in your system, you can guesstimate what you have. And of course, I'm assuming, again at the bottom of the screen, that she was pregnant to abort. In a lot of cases, they're not. So that's an observable abortion. That's the definition I like to use when you're talking about the epidemiology, the pathology of abortion. That's what will go into a lab. So for those of you at the back of the screen, there's a scalpel handle down the bottom. Scalpel handle is 14 centimetres. This is about twice the length of a scalpel handle. That's what it looks like. OK. I've created a portmanteau here that's new, use it or not, which is a peri stillbirth, because we get hung up on, is it a stillbirth? Is it perinatal mortality? It's actually irrelevant, because farmers don't record things that well anyway. But when you're doing research studies, it kind of matters. So I've put the two together here. So what do I mean by that? I mean, it could be independently viable at term. Arbitrarily, it dies at some period thereafter. You can say it dies at birth or up to any period. I use 48 hours in my research. Other people use different definitions. There's no such thing as at calving. At has to be either before, during, or after. So I'm including that in the definition. It's irrespective of the circumstances of the cause of loss. It doesn't make a difference whether it's deformed or not. It's a peri stillbirth. I would debate we should be moving on from that as uh, human uh, pediatric pediatric medicine does, to plurality adjusted birth weight thresholds. So a single and twin will have norms of birth that we should be including when we're describing what a stillbirth is. Similarly, we should have parity adjusted weights. But that's the honours question. We're dealing with the past question here today. What does it look like? So that's a 260-day fetus. It's almost indistinguishable from a 270-day or 280-day or perhaps a 290-day. A 300-day will have longer hair coat. But essentially, you wouldn't say that's particularly premature. That's what it looks like. OK, so that's the basic background. So why bother investigating? I'm presenting two answers for you, those of you at the back. Down the bottom it says surveillance and service. <coughs> surveillance as an individual practitioner you may have no interest in, but remember there's 42% of the audience here who perhaps do have an interest in it. So they're interested in incursion of new diseases. So for example, the classic one in Ireland is Schmallenberg. Schmallenberg was detected by a regional veterinary laboratory, surveillance. The second one is trends in endemic diseases. So we know, for example, in Ireland, 30 years ago you see a lot of goiters in these calves, you don't see goiters today, very rare. Third one is to answer questions you didn't ask. So I conducted a prospective study. I wasn't particularly interested in atresias in calves, but I discovered we have more atresias in Ireland than we thought. We have a different type of atresia in Ireland. I didn't ask the question, but I answered it. So we're Irish, we do odd things like that. <laughs> the second one is service, and this is where the 58% would be interested. So this might be a standard, and I'm just supposing a standard response to a farm with an abortion. The vet takes the bloods and the farmer drops the fetus into the lab. Everybody's happy. What if there wasn't any lab anymore? This is a report from one of our farming, our uh, largest farming newspaper in 2015. 50% of our regional vet laboratories to close. So this is Ireland, the Republic of Ireland. These are the catchment areas of the six veterinary labs. And this is what it would look like if three of our labs closed. We have three black spots in the country. So it will no longer be convenient for many, 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 many farmers to submit calves to our laboratory. So the days of telling the farmer just submit the calves to the lab would be gone. So, so come back to the question again. This has already happened in the UK, and the response in small scale has been practitioners doing it for themselves. So these are post-mortem service provided by individuals independent of the government laboratory service. It hasn't happened here. It may be occurring in your countries. 
So let's go further about why bother investigating stillbirths. In 2015, I ran a workshop at BCVA, the British Cattle Vet Association. Before the workshop about investigating stillbirths, I asked them, why are you here? So this is exactly what they said to me. I'm here to provide a better service and knowledge to my farmers. So generic, I want to be better. I want to be better informed. I want better information for farmers about what we can expect to find if we decide to investigate. So they're not keen to investigate. They want to have the information to decide, will I or will I not? They need to answer the farmer's questions. Why did that calf die? Why am I getting so many abortions? I want to know what investigations are worthwhile. So if I do investigate, where should I put, where do I get best bang for my buck? Is it taking bloods? Is it sending placentas? Is it examining fetuses? Is it risk assessment? And the more advanced practitioners then were asking, they want to develop practice protocols so that a multi-person practice, one person always did this, one person always did that. They wanted a protocol for all. So you can see we all have different things we want to get out of this. Okay, so the next thing I move to is investigative thresholds. So this is, I think I'm going to investigate, but I'm not sure what level I will investigate. And I perhaps differentiate again at the bottom of the screen, I've written case series and clusters. So the case series might be more relevant in an all year round calving herd where abortions are occurring at a steady rate and at some point you decide the prevalence is high enough, it's a tipping point, you investigate. In a seasonal calving system, it's nothing like that. Over a weekend, three cows abort. One aborts on Monday. It's a cluster, it's a panic, we investigate. That's simply how it happens in practice. You could debate that some of these clusters are not genuine. If you use scan statistics, you can work out the probability of that cluster being genuine and not pathological. We don't do it. But anyway, so now there's another question. It's not like this in your app, but it's similar to it. And the question is, at what percentage of abortion or stillbirth do you investigate? So in your app, you're still looking at me. You're not going to answer it by looking at me. Have any of you got connection that you can answer it? I know I'm on a loser here, but some may be able to answer it. Um, oh, yeah, OK. This looks vaguely like the first question. It is the first question. I think we might move on to the next question. So if we do have answer, in a minute I'll go to hands, but I'm trying to give tech a chance. OK, uh, where have we got? Oh, wow. Mm, mm, I can't interpret that. <laughs> These don't make sense. Okay, I'm going to go to hands. So my question is, abortions. At what level do you consider investigating? So I'm going to give you options. Less than equal to 2%, 2 to 5 or greater than 5. Less than equal to 2%, hands. Lovely. 2 to 5%. Hands. Greater than equal to 5. Right, so we're in the category of 2 to 5% exactly as predicted. Let's spin it on stillbirths. So these are terms. 0 to 2 percent, no hands, 2 to 5, less hands than previously, greater than equal to 5. So that means very few people investigate because we didn't get 100 percent of the, even of the practitioners in that poll. <laughs> it's difficult. Okay, I won't waste time on it. All right, uh, next slide. Okay, so the, inquest, the question to investigate or not. There's some nice data presented by Kenny et al. at BCV 2014, and I now discovered the poster here. I should have cited that. So they, they surveyed farmers in the British Isles about abortions and practitioners. And the definition of abortion by the farmer was similar to what I've described here. The perceived abortion rate was about 2% perceived. The investigation threshold for farmers or for vets was similar to what you said here, roughly 5%. The investigation rate, however, for farmers was 51%, but 97% of vets advised investigation. So we've had a gap here. Farmers are doing one thing, vets are advising the other. It's like in a lot of other problems. Okay, the motivations are interesting. This is difficult for you to read at the bottom. What motivated a farmer to investigate an abortion was there's too many occurring, and if there was lower investigation costs, he'd investigate more, or she. The vets, similarly, but they also would investigate at any abortion level. So the vets did see the surveillance relevance of investigating any abortion. The barriers, farm blindness. So some farmers were just not cognizant of the fact that the abortion rate they had was too high. They didn't see it as such, so they didn't investigate it. Inconvenience, all lab submissions are determined by location. Closer to the lab, more likely to submit. So we tend to have under triage for some of the calves that come in locally, whereas we should have over triage for calves that come in from a distance because they're not likely to send in a next calf. For vets, the barriers were cost was number one, which is not what farmers considered. So a knowledge gap here again. The low diagnosis rate. So we're familiar with that, and we'll deal with it in a minute. OK, 
What I've talked about there has been the British Isles, but on the bottom of the screen you can't read it. It's not unusual in the US, Canada, I guess, Israel, these are very high producing herds who have abortion rates in the 10% range. So talking about 2% in those industries is irrelevant. They operate at a totally different level. So you need local benchmarks. So benchmarking. These are data that ICBF, our Nat National Cattle Federation, provides to all of their farmers every year on numerous different diseases. Here I'm going to focus on loss within um, 24 hours of birth. So this farmer, he happens to have only 42 animals, so he had zero loss, no surprise. But he knows, or she knows, looking at their data, that the worst 15% in the country are at 7%, and the best 15% are at 2%. So that's not a book value, that's a real world value. So farmers in Ireland know they can achieve 2% loss because their farmer's doing it. That's real valuable data, that's benchmarking in action. But in your industry, you may have to move that value up and down. That may have no relevance to you. So there's no point taking notes about that value. It's about creating values for your industry. Okay, moving from that through the cause of death. Um, I tend to focus on a clinical pathological diagnosis. The pathologist is not king. They won't like me saying that here, because there's 42% of them here listening to me, but anyway. <laughs> it is between the clinician and the pathologist, the cause of death. For example, if you submit a calf to a lab and the essential cause of death was slow calving and milk fever in the cow, the pathologist can diagnose bradytosia, but not the reason. You need to link the two. Okay, so let's deal with abortion first. And essentially, down at the bottom, we're essentially dealing with infectious. And we say non-infectious, we mean we don't know the cause. Non-infectious really means nothing. It just means you don't know the cause. So these are the latest published data. So they're in theory all last month. So again, for you at the back, uh, Clotier, if that's pronounced correctly, in Anderson, 2016. <coughs> Um, cause of abortion, UC Davis, US, so again may not apply to other populations of animals. A large subset, 665 fetuses in the subset. What did they find? 47% they identified an agent. 11%, so almost 60% were infectious causes, leaving all the other details out. We looked at the UK of cases where they took out the DNRs, 80% were infectious. So, primarily infectious cause of abortion. I'm not telling you anything you didn't know. Cause of stillbirth, and again down the bottom of the screen, I've got explained and unexplained. So we're a little bit more honest about stillbirths. We can explain some, we just can't explain the others. But we can't even describe the unexplained well enough. So this was um, a Delphi study we conducted in 2013 across 23 countries of about 75 vets to get an idea of what are your assigned cause of mortality and what are your criteria for that. And the outstanding finding, in my opinion, was lack of standardization in the classification of causes of mortality. We are not unique. Human medicine, exactly the same. Even the WHO criteria for cause of death are not used internationally. So everybody has their own way of deciding, is it traumatosia, is it bradytosia? It's not standardized. So I'll point that out first. Okay, so these are data from our Irish cattle population. Again, they may not extrapolate to yours. So dairy calves down at the bottom, sentinel and whole herd active surveillance model, not a passive model. Two-thirds of deaths were associated with co-mortality or dystochia, and I'll explain what these terms mean. And for those of you that are awake, you'll see the parentheses around dystochia. So if we disaggregate the co-mortality, we'll see dystochia appearing again and again. So dystochia is the driver, but there are other causes associated with it. If we disaggregate the dystochia, inverted commas, because I understand dystochia to mean abnormal, not difficult calving. I learned in college dystochia meant difficult. In my opinion, it doesn't. It's an abnormal calving. And down here, again, you can't read at the back, the first ranking is bradytosia. It's not traumatosia. And the second ranking in our population is maldisposition, and the third is traumatosia. That's quite different from 20 years ago. So literature may be static, but the world isn't. Things move on and change. OK, so this is the largest study you could find on beef catalyst, 2010, from Canada. Again, it's difficult for you to read the, the x-axis. I'll explain it. Common cause of stillbirth in beef, so dystochia is the first one here, about 40%. So again, driving loss, dystochia. In their population, dysthyrosis, so these were abnormalities histologically of the thyroid gland, was the second. Third is myocardiopathies, again, histological abnormalities in the myocardium. Congenital defects, other, undetermined, approximately 20%. So the driver in both populations is essentially the same. The details did vary. Okay, so I've used terms here that I'm familiar with, but you may not be, so I have to be careful about that. I use the term traumatosia to mean trauma induced at calving, because trauma can be induced post calving. You have to be clear which it is. 
There's an excellent poster from a Polish colleague in the poster room at the moment describing these lesions with visual images of them. I advise you to have a look at it. These are examples. So this is what we'd find. About 1% to 2% of stillborn calves have a fractured leg. It may or may not have anything to do with the cause of death, but it's present in them. Surprisingly, 10 times more of these calves have fractured ribs. They're not diagnosed clinically. They primarily occur in heifers' calves. They occur in calves coming backwards. They occur predominantly at the costosternal junction, beneath the elbow, so they're not palpated. So this clinically is something that I know we're missing. They cause polytrauma, so you'll get hemothorax. In these cases, you'll often get rupture of the uh, liver. You'll get diaphragmatic hernias, many other lesions. This is certainly not diagnosed commonly in practice either. I say commonly, I'm basing it on my experience of talking to practitioners. So you can argue with me if you want, but that's my experience. This is a fractured spine. Of course, in about 3% of these calves, half of them are post-mortem fractures. The calf is already dead when it fractures, so it's irrelevant. But the other half are anti-mortem. And I'll show you a good clinical test for describing these after. These, in my experience, are all due to misuse of a calving aid. Not use of a calving aid. Misuse of a calving aid. Critical difference. OK, time of death. I mentioned previously that calves don't die at calving. They die before, during, or after. So how can we know when? This is a term that comes from human medicine, which is an event compresses mortality. So in this case, calving compresses mortality. So you don't get a normal distribution in calf death in time post-calving, no. You get a left skewed distribution with 95% of calves dying before, during, or within five minutes. And that has huge implications for responses. So there's no point talking about responding an hour or half an hour after. As calves are dead or alive by then. So the acronym I use is simple, survive till five. If a calf survives till five, it'll survive. Five minutes matter. Okay, tech, please save me on this one. So my question to you is, you've got a fetus, you take it out, you see this, how long do you think it's dead? For those of you that are working on your phones, which is very few, you're all looking at me. So the options are, this calf is dead, and I'm just asking you to focus on one thing. I know there are lots of other things you'd see in the calf. Do you think it's more than six hours or right up to more than a month? So they're the kind of options. So I'm trying to get is a feel for so, so the reason I put this up is, in Irish farming systems, when a calf comes out, and if it's dead, this is the first thing the farmer looks at. They call it the scum on the eye, or the blue of the eye. They know it straight away. You all know it as well. So my question to you is, what do you think? So could we, if we have a poll on that, could we put it up? It's not. It is. It should be. Have we a problem with it? If it's, if it's not, let's not waste time. So I'll give you simple options. Let's take the simple one. I think it's just greater than equal to six hours, hands. One or two, OK. Let's go greater than equal to 12 hours, a lot more. Let's push it up to two days, more, slightly more. Go right out to seven days. OK, very few. A month, very few, right. So. so so we know we're somewhere down around here. That's what we're saying. I think I'm happy with that. OK, so these are the criteria for how long a calf is dead in utero. Corneal opacity occurs within 12 hours. It occurs really quickly in utero. It doesn't occur really quickly ex utero. So if you leave a calf in a calving pen for seven days, you will never see those changes. They don't occur the same ex utero. So these are the criteria here. So this is an example of a calf's eye that's put into a water bath and it's 12 hours in a water bath at, at body temperature to simulate in utero conditions. That's that same eye 24 hours later. So, so all I'm saying is it occurs really quickly in simple terms. There'll be some really nice data, again, coming off some Polish colleagues who are re-evaluating the scale in about a year's time, and they'll have some really nice data on re-evaluation of this. This is a simple thing that we all learn in college, which is the lung flotation test. So if you're unsure, has this calf breathed it or not? In the obvious ones, the 100% atelectasis, there's no decision. 100% inflated, there's no decision. You do get partial atelectasis, and you do get congestion. So sometimes you can be confused saying it is this when it's actually not. So even I will use lung flotation, and I've seen lots of lungs. It's well worth doing it. So simply you drop it in. If it sinks, it's atelectasis. If it stays on the surface, it's inflated. If it's congested, it tends to sink and come back up. Simple thing to do, costs nothing. OK, so we've gone through all the, 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 the theory behind it. So what should a practitioner do when investigating fetopathy in cattle? OK, I mentioned this already, the herd and the individual. OK, so let's start with the herd. 
This is simply the questions that you would intuitively ask, but particularly for practitioners who are starting in practice, sometimes they don't have this in the back of their mind because they haven't done it before. So I'm going to run through some very basics. How many? Because we know from the literature that if a farmer says this is the index case, there's likely to be at least two cases before that that they haven't sent into a laboratory. So the first submitted case is hardly ever the first case. So you need to back check, well, have there actually been cases prior? When did they start? So in a seasonal calving system, that's kind of important. Heifers or cows, there may be risk factors for infectious diseases in heifers. They may be vaccinated differently. They may be on a different part of the farm to the cows. So it's important to know. Any issues with the dam? Recent management is critical. So even though you, on, on some industries in the world, you may be vaccinating the animals, in our industries, the farmer is vaccinating, may or may not be buying the vaccine from the practitioner. So over time, vaccine protocols drift. So just assuming the farmer vaccinates for lepto, BVD, salmonella may be incorrect. They may have substituted the salmonella vaccine for some other vaccine and dropped it. So you need to go back to basics. And there's a whole lot of questions there about did you give two doses and all of that. BMT results. BMT results, a single BMT result, as we know, is not a whole lot of use. But a trend in BMT results over time, that's bulk milk test antibody testing, which most of our Irish farmers now have, is very useful in these investigations. What are they being fed? So we know there's a lot of pathogens associated with poor quality silage. Fungi, bee lich, listeria, common things. Problems with fertility, this may indicate that there's a pre-existing problem on the farm. Recent changes in management. A colleague of mine has shown a lovely temporal association between drying off cows in a seasonal calving system and a peak in abortions at a lag phase thereafter. Lovely epidemiology. Okay. If we talk about the Perry stillbirth, we are going back. This is a crime scene investigation. The critical factors are the questions you ask about calving and the quality of the questions you ask and who you ask. So asking the person who didn't attend the calving is a waste of time. You have to get the person who, who attended the calving. Clinical size movement at calving. So some of you know about JIT calving in the States. I would add to JIT NIT, which is not in time calving. A lot of that occurs as well. The location of the calving, the supervision, the duration. What type of assistance was their problem in maldisposition? Calf resuscitation, attempted or not? Do they know how to resuscitate calves? So rather than just getting a calf and opening it up, if you don't have this background, which sometimes the people in the laboratories don't have, it can be very hard to link the pathology to the clinical signs, and that's critical. Collate lab results. You may already have lab results on this farm, so you don't need to rush out in an abortion outbreak and bleed and collect milk samples. You may have all of that on the farm. So the first thing to do is, what do we know about it? I mentioned previous investigations, data you have from those. Examining the pregnant cohort, and ideally you would do this before you rush into the, the abortic cow is going to be standing in the crush when you arrive on the farm waiting for you, the placenta hanging from you, and you're automatically going to put your gloves on and go out and start sampling the cow. Ideally you should go back into the dry cow pen and examine the cows there to pick up, is there something at a herd level I should see, and when you finish that, come back in and examine the aborting cow. So in the, in the cohort, you're looking at their body conditions. So in our system, on a five-point scale, 3.25 is where we expect them or target them to be. So if you're talking about peri stillbirths, if you walk into a group of heifers and they're all at four plus, then it's kind of obvious why we've got a problem. Mature body weight, we target 90% at calving, so it'll vary what type of genotype of animal we have. But visually assessing them, you'll say, these heifers are too small and they're too fat. So we don't need to go looking for mycotoxins here. This is very simple. Any clinical signs in the group? The aborting cow may or may not have the signs, but looking at the group, you may see that there's a lot of dirty noses in this group. There's cows panting, check a few temperatures, there's temperatures in the group. And the feed quality and management. I apologize, I am racing through slightly for the international audience who I'm speaking a bit fast for, but I am keen we have questions as well. Okay, so comparative serology. Serodiagnosis is, is essentially what a lot of practitioners do for the aborted case. So simply comparing cohorts with cases is a good way to establish is there presence or absence of antibodies in cohorts and cases, and if you get enough of each, is there a difference in the prevalence between them? Specifically, maternal serology. So, and this refers to an Irish system. So I was discussing with a Belgian colleague the other day. They wouldn't look for salmonella like Dublin, for example. So it's perhaps not as important as their system. So it's what's relevant to your system of management. For us, these are relevant. And if there's a case series, other things are relevant. Again, they're, they're location-specific. We know that we're talking about maternal serology. The interpretation of that is it can be used as an exclusionary test. So if we bleed the dam, it's Neospora antibody negative. This is not going to be caused by Neospora. We can't say the same if it's lepto negative. 
We know it's just exposure, it's not causation. And that's the danger of putting these results into farmers' hands, because if you tell them they're leptopositive, they assume, ergo, it caused the abortion. So sharing data is great, interpreting data is better. The single and the paired sample, paired samples are what we learned in college. In the real world, we don't do it. So single sampling is what's carried out. In conjunction with colleagues in our uh, region veterinary laboratories, we've examined the salmonella Dublin SAT and how it can be interpreted on a single sample. We now know that we can be 85% accurate with a single blood for salmonella Dublin to tell you it's culture positive or negative. That's quite useful. So single blood is very practical. And you need to know, of course, are they vaccinated? When were they vaccinated? Did they get the full course? So just pulling a blood and getting a positive or negative result really requires the vet to get in there and interpret it. OK, so moving from the herd down into the case, I've mentioned the clinical pathological diagnosis. So we start with the placenta. Um, so this is what I describe as a premature placental separation. There are other terms for it. I see this in about 10 to 15% of stillbirths. It's not uncommon. Predominantly occurs in heifers, two types of it. You get the individual case and you get the outbreaks. The individual sporadic cases, in both cases, they're predominantly associated with bradytosia, a slow calving. And in the sole cases, it's predominantly a maldisposition. You do get it in induced calvings as well. You do get it in aborted fetuses. If you get outbreaks, you tend to get a lot of slow calving, so subclinical milk fever association, dead in utero calves. Um, anecdotally, excess selenium disturbed heifers at calving. They're the risk factors for getting this. And if that placenta is cut off and that calf is sent to the lab, the pathologist will not diagnose the cause. They'll describe the pathology, but not the cause. You get other pathology in the placenta, and for you at the back, there's basically shown a wrap of a long umbilical cord be behind the hind leg of the calf. So we get cord accidents. They're much more common in foals. We get them in calves as well. We tend not to see them. So you do, get, you do get broken cords, you do get wrapped cords like this around the neck or the hind leg of the calf. If you're looking at placentas, you need to know some basic things about the normal. So the normal placenta is going to weigh 2 to 7 kilos, about 5 kilos in weight. It's going to have between 75 and 120 cotyledons. You're not going to count them, but you can eyeball them. The intercotyledonary tissue is going to be translucent. That's a normal placenta. So if you don't know that, don't go diagnosing placentitis. That's a gross, obvious, oedematous, placentitic placenta. So I'm taking one extreme to the other, but there's lots of in-betweens. OK, sampling the placenta. Often, there won't be a placenta. We know in all laboratories throughout the world, people don't submit placentas. It's retained, it's eaten, or it's discarded in the bedding. Submission. This is a normal placenta, this is an abnormal placenta. Probably more likely to get something off this. This is not the part of the placenta you want to submit to the lab. This is the part you want to submit. If you end up with pulling this out of the cubicle house and that's all you have, hose it down and send a bit of it in. How much of it would you send in? You don't need more than three cotyledons with a bit of intercotyledonary tissue. So you don't need to send the whole placenta in, but sending one cotyledon maybe isn't enough either. So three cotyledons is not difficult to do. What they do in the lab, they'll do in the lab, or you'll request what they do in the lab. And given that this is a practitioner-focused talk, I'm not going to go through the detail of it, but there are caveats associated with it. OK, so moving through to phytopsy. So this is the ideal world. This is a beautiful post-mortem facility inside the university, and photopsies are conducted by board-certified pathologists, and they give exceedingly good results. But the 58% here only see this on the screen when they're in college. There's no relevance to them. This is the 58%. Down on a hard pad somewhere, the rain is running down the back of their neck, and they're trying to get this while they're answering the phone and going to a call. It's a different world. But this can be upgraded. So I was in the UK last year in a practice set up their own necropsy facility within their practice with really good facilities, rivaling veterinary laboratories. Because they perceive that the local lab can't provide the service, they'll have to provide it themselves. So we can upgrade. Okay, this is a teachable moment. I know it's an American term that perhaps we don't use. So doing a necropsy in front of your client is an egg on face moment as well, but it is a teachable moment because they've never seen these things inside the calf at all. So showing lung consolidation, the example of the previous speaker in pneumonia, is very powerful. Much better than anything you can say is for them to see. It's like ultrasonography. You telling them the cow is pregnant is totally different to them seeing a heartbeat. Really is valuable. Okay, is it even worth doing this? We'll try. Will we try? I don't think we'll do it. Oh, somebody's already answered. How did that happen? Okay, I don't know if I'm going to trust this result, but let's see what we've got. So about a third of practitioners conduct phytopsies on aborted fetuses. 
I'm surprised it's so high, that's my response, but I'm not trusting the text, so. There should be another answer if there is one. So the first was aborted fetus, the next should be stillbirth fetus, stillborn fetuses. Okay. So in this, yes, 24, okay, rough, roughly 25% of stillbirths. Um, again, I'm surprised, but we have an international audience. I don't think it would be true in Ireland, but we're speaking to 78 countries here, so this could be true. Okay, I kind of believe it. Okay, next slide. <laughs> Okay, so this is basic necropsy kit. So if you're going out to do a post-mortem, you need basic kit. The same as you would if you're going to scan a cow, you need a scanner. Boning knife and steel, bone saw, scalpel handle, disposable stuff, rat tooth forceps, cigarette lighter. Why is he to put that in? I'll explain. You don't have to be a smoker to do a necropsy, I should explain. <laughs> camera and a pen. I mention a camera because we don't do it now, but remote digital necropsy is the future in some countries. So in Canada, in feedlot, techs, do remote digital necropsy via cameras. So just bear it in mind, in future we will be doing some of that. The basic gear to collect your samples, okay. In terribly basic terms, want to do a post-mortem, have that in the boot of the car, can do post-mortem. Nothing more than that to it, okay. Okay, so the first thing, I, I have vet students down every spring. I, I, I didn't explain at the beginning, but every spring I examine between 250 and 500 calves of this range, and I vet students down with me. We learn a lot from each other, but the one thing they all want to do is sharpen a knife and get in there. And the first thing to do is don't take up the knife. It's examine the fetus. So the basic single twin size. We've had a lot of talk about heart girts, which is thoracic circumference. You won't do it in practice, but you can if you want to get your eye in. You can judge the size of the fetus using the crown rump length. There's a nice simple formula there. So crown rump length is either a straight crown lump length with a ruler or a curved. And I won't go into detail on it, but you can do it. Preservation. I've mentioned this already, so I won't de deal it in detail. Obvious lesions you can see. So in this calf, it's obvious this calf is an enterocele. The farmer with small ones won't even have noticed it. It's not necessarily the cause of death, but it's something you would point out to your client. And in Ireland now, we are collecting data on congenital defects. We're collecting tissue samples from them. So in the future, you should see less of these calves. Okay. Fetal size can be an embarrassing one. If you look at a fetus and you say, I think that's about four months, and the eye data says this is six months, it doesn't look good. So it's simply getting your eye in. So again, at the bottom, of the, at the end of the hole, there's a scalpel handle down there, and the scalpel handle goes from about there to there. It's 14 centimeters. That's a two-month fetus, so it's smaller than a scalpel handle. That's a three-month fetus, and it's bigger than a scalpel handle. And that's a four-month fetus, and it's about twice the size of a scalpel handle. That's what small fetuses look like. Okay, so when you move on, a six-month fetus, it's going to have some hair on the eyes and the muzzle. It's going to weigh about six kilos. It's got to have a crown on length of about 50 centimetres. Seven-month fetus is going to have a hair coat, a very light hair coat on it. It's going to weigh about 14 kilos. It's going to have about a 70 centimetre crown rump length. Eight-month fetus is going to have an obvious hair coat. It's going to have dentition appearing now. It's going to weigh about 28, 30 kilos, about a 90 centimetre crown rump length. A preterm or a term, you're going up to the 30, 35, depending on the genotype of your animals. Um, it's going to have a crown rump length of 95 with a variation of plus or minus 15, so they're quite variable at term. So the growth in the latter part of pregnancy is weight, it's length prior. So it's just to have an idea, you don't need to know what day it is, it's a roughly a six month or a seven month, that's all you need. Okay, so you're looking at the carcass and that's what you see, so really what you want to do is instantly pick up, there's something obviously wrong with the carcass. And in this case, there's gross abdominal distension. So in my lab now, my tech can diagnose what I reckon 99% accuracy that that's an atresia without touching the calf. That's quite good in that he's no veterinary training at all. Practitioners should be able to do the same thing, and I know from the submissions we get, they don't all do it. So in these calves, you'll see that the classical case that they don't have meconium in the rectum. It's a simple clinical sign you can use because we know some of these calves are on farms for up to 10 and 12 days, undiagnosed. That's a welfare issue. I won't go into more detail in the interest of time. So some obvious things, abomasocele, get them in about 2 to 3% of calves. We get these in about 9% of calves, so they're not uncommon. I'm talking about dead calves. This was the, um, I mentioned this earlier about calves fracturing their spine. Almost 100, although it's because of biology, I can't say 100, but almost 100% of fractures occur at the thoracolumbar junction. This is the spinal shelf. So if you're able to manipulate the spine at that junction, there is a fractured spine. So clinically, when you attend or assist a dystocia and you find this, the prognosis is zero, put down the calf at the, at the calving, but you need to diagnose it first. So there's a classic, and I know I'm showing you very obvious cases, there's a whole lot of variation in it, but that's an obvious case. Okay, 
the head of the calf. These things are obvious. Congenital defects occurs in calves, and if we use passive surveillance data, we'd say about 5%. If you use active surveillance data with, with a, a timed necropsy, you'll have four times that amount of congenital defects. So be careful how you interpret that data. It doesn't mean there are four times more defect out there. It means you've examined calves in a different way. And that's important if you're, for example, working for a drug company, investigating a pollution event or a drug adverse effect. You need to be careful what you're saying. Gingival pallor. Students don't look at the gingiva. You may or may not, but it's something worth looking at. Cross-section the tongue. Pull the tongue out, cut it in half, look for oedema. Pallor of the conjunctiva. Enophthalmus. Scleral or bulbar conjunctival hemorrhages. How am I on time? Bad. Okay. <laughs> Legs I'm going to scoot through. Visually, it's, it's, it's good enough to see. Simple things like this calf never stood, this calf stood, or rats ate the golden hoof off. You need to differentiate between the two. Opening the fetus is wet lab stuff. I just said I'd show it here, but I'm not going to go through it. So this is stuff you learn in a wet lab. You don't learn in a dry theater or a dry voice. Obvious things you can see when you open up peritonitis. Fractured spine with hemorrhage, indicating it occurred anti-mortem, not a post-mortem one. Hemoperitoneum, students always answer, and I'm not down on students, students are great, so apologies, but they don't have experience. Always it's a, it's a ruptured spleen, that's their first guess. It's never a ruptured spleen. Calves don't rupture their spleen, they do rupture their liver. They do have amphalaragia, two top causes of this. All ruptured livers are not caused by trauma. Okay, site of fracture of thorax, extensive pathology. I'm trying to see where I am. Okay, lungs of the calf within an hour of birth. 20% look like this, 20% look like this, that's partial atelectasis, and 40% look like this. 60% of these calves are potentially resuscitable, but farmers don't appreciate that. They assume all of these calves look like that, they don't. Okay, things in the neck you'll see, oedema, colostrum, stomach tube damage. Farmers buying a new stomach tube, not knowing how to use it, rupturing the esophagus, colostrum. Hemorrhages in the thymus. How am I going? Over time. I'm over time. Okay, I think in the interest of getting questions, I have other slides. I'm just going to slop. Apologies, I tried to put too much in. The tech didn't work. But let's get questions. Don't worry about it. Right, we'll take questions. Thank you. And questions, please. And wait until the microphone comes to you. We have only about two or three minutes. Well, I'll start, John, and I'll mention um, the thyroid. Just... Mm. Do you look at the thyroid and also, as regards getting, gathering a history, pre-calving mineral supplementation? Perfect timing. I didn't set John up for that question, but anyway, thyroid. <laughs> so the, the, the thyroid in a normal dairy calf weighs 13 grams. In blood and radicis, when I went to college, they said 7 grams. They're only talking about one lobe. So it normally weighs about 13 grams. That's goiter. So it's very obvious to see it in a calf. Anything greater than 30 grams, in my opinion, is goitrous because 90% of those have hyperplastic changes. So these are other examples. You can use your scalpel here to see it. So 90% of calves that are thyroid greater than 30 grams are going to look like this on histopath. We see hardly any of them now. If I'm guessing to give an estimate, less than 5%. So it has disappeared out of our industry. 20 years ago, that would have been 30%, and there are published data showing that. What's happened in the meantime? Farms have gotten on to routine dry cow supplementation with minerals, and not just iodine because we now know the interrelation between iodine, selenoenzymes, and selenium. So that's critical. If you're advising a farmer, if you pull this up on a necropsy, you don't necessarily say it's the cause of death, because there's data stating it doesn't cause death. But what you do, in my opinion, is you assess the dry cow mineral status, particularly for iodine and selenium, and you supplement appropriately. Um, Any more, a question John, here? Yeah, yeah uh, John, uh, Rachel Brown, uh, Ireland. Just a very practical question. Um, are we going to have any problems from the dead lorry collection men if we are cutting up all these fetuses? Yeah, it, it, and it's a really good practical point. Um, you, you, legally, you can do the post-mortem on the farm, but perhaps the better place to do it is at the knackery, where there are conditions for disposable thereafter. I know this is awkward for you in practice, but if you, if you bulk them up in an arrangement with the knackery, that's the best place to do it, because you, you don't want to go around sewing these up. It's a waste of time. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the answer to me. If there's another question, we'll take yeah. it. Yes, one uh, here, the last one. Jim Keller from Cork, um, Ireland. Um, from your experience in doing postmortems, John, do you believe that 
calves inhale amniotic fluids, I'm not sure I believe it, but you would know from doing postmortems. Mm. And could you just give an opinion on uh, hanging up a calf that has difficulty breeding? Have you seen uh, uh, damage to calves uh, at postmortems? Okay. Two questions. I I'll reverse the question. I'll take the easy one first. Um, in my opinion, suspending a calf for a brief period, brief meaning no longer than 30 seconds, is good. There are Belgian data showing it's effective in caesarean-born Belgian blue calves, not in dairy calves, but I think the principle translates. So there's always this argument that suspending a calf compresses the lungs because the weight of the guts are on the lungs, but there is a diaphragm. The lungs don't go into the thorax. So my advice is yes, do it. Do it for a short period. Do it carefully for your own back. So there is a nice technique of reversing the ropes on a calf's leg and running them up a jack, not lifting them at all. You can do it. So in answer to that, um, I think it's good to do it under those conditions. The inhale amniotic fluid one is one I find difficult to grasp as a concept because the animal is born in an environment of amniotic fluid. They're not in a desert in the cow. They're in a liquid environment. So it at no point surprises me that there's amniotic fluid in the calf when it's born. But they do swallow amniotic fluid, and amniotic fluid does get into the trachea because we know when we see meconium stained calves, the exterior of the calf is covered in meconium, the trachea will also be full of meconium. So they do inhale amniotic fluid from their environment and they do swallow it. We get in the apomasum as well. And that's the most obvious example of it. Um, I think we have to call it much as we'd like to work on longer. But I want to thank uh, Dr. May for his presentation.